The twelve Sunday after Pentecost. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The epistle is taken from the epistle of the Apostle St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, such confidence we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are sufficient to think anything of ourselves as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also hath made us fit ministers of the New Testament, not in the letter, but in the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit quickeneth. Now if the ministration of death engraven with letters upon stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which is made void, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather more glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more the ministration of justice aboundeth in glory. Continuation of the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke At that time Jesus said to his disciples, Blessed are the eyes that see the things which you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings have desired to see the things that you see, and have not seen them, and to hear the things that you hear, and have not heard them. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up, tempting him, and saying, Master, what must I do to possess eternal life? But he said to him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? He answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, and with thy whole soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said to him, Thou hast answered rightly, This do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among robbers, who also stripped him, and having wounded him, went away, leaving him half dead. And it chanced that a certain priest went down the same way, and seeing him, passed by. And like manner also a Levite, when he was near the place and saw him, passed by. But a certain Samaritan, being on his journey, came near him, and seeing him, was moved with compassion, and going up to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and setting him upon his own beast, brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two pence, and gave to the host, and said, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou shalt spend over and above, at my return I will repay thee. Which of these three, in thine opinion, was neighbor to him that fell among robbers? But he said, He that showed mercy to him. And Jesus said to him, Go, and do thou in like manner. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear friends, every now and then I like to take the sermon to explain both the epistle and the gospel, going verse by verse. I cannot do perhaps all of it, but at least we'll try to cover some. Now, if we go to the epistle, we have to look at the context. In the epistle of the Corinthians, the Apostle St. Paul first was telling the Corinthians how there were others who claimed to be better apostles. There were others who claimed, you could say, to be better priests. And the Apostle wrote to them, in, those, in this epistle and said to them, My witness for me being an apostle, you know, the things that are my confidence, is you yourselves, because you yourselves converted to the faith through my ministry. And so after that, he says what we read today. He says, we, sa we have such confidence, but we have it through Christ towards God. And then the apostle St. Paul emphasizes one point. That is important for us to remember. He says, We are not sufficient to think anything of ourselves. Meaning, I am not able to have even a good thought by myself. It has to come from God. God has to give me the strength. He has to give me the grace. Even to have just a good thought. Much more to do any good work or to preach as the apostle would preach. Now, this is a point that is significant for us to remember. Because... Sometimes we might think to ourselves, well, I will change this then. I will change this defect later. You know, I will repent when I'm about to die. Or I will try to go to confession this time or that time. And we have to remember 
These things are not in our hands. I don't have the power to decide when I go to confession. God has to give me the grace, and if God refuses the grace, I won't have it. The apostle continues, he says, Who also have made us fit ministers of the New Testament, not in the letter, but in the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit quickeneth. The apostle, when he speaks here of the letter and the Spirit, he is referring to the letter as the letter of the law, meaning the Old Testament. And the Spirit is the law itself also, but not so much according to the letter, but according to the Spirit, to the Holy Ghost, meaning to the instructions that we receive from the Church, which is the instrument of the Holy Ghost. And the Apostle emphasized this, and we read this also in the Gospel today. He emphasized that some might have the letter, meaning they might have the knowledge of the Bible, they might know verses and quote verses from Scripture, but they don't have the Spirit, meaning they are not working under the inspiration of God, and therefore they don't really attain eternal life. They don't get to receive the grace that God gives us through the church. These words are very often used, and, and I'll, we, I'll give the real translation from them here. It says, it says in here, the letter killeth, but the spirit quickeneth. And what it means is that the letter kills, but the spirit, I think it's, you could say it in English, vivifies, meaning it gives life. And again, what that means is that the letter itself, meaning knowledge, without charity, knowledge without the inspiration of the church and obedience to the church, kills. But it is obedience to the church, the spirit, that meaning the Holy Ghost. It is charity that vivifies, that gives life. This is very significant when you look at the Protestants, for example, and the Catholic Church. In Protestant religions, you will see that they, as I said, they know the Bible all over the place. They know the Bible. But they know the letter of the Bible. They don't know the spirit of the Bible. They don't have the charity to, to live the Bible. And you'll find on the other side a very simple Catholic who perhaps doesn't know the Bible, who is perhaps uh, addressed to by Protestants, And they come and they quote all these verses from the Bible, and he doesn't have to quote any of those things. He has the Spirit. He has charity. He's inspired by God. And he's able to say, I don't need to know all those things. I don't need to know all these verses. I don't need to quote all these numbers. All that I need to know is what God teaches me through the instrument of the Holy Ghost, which is the Church. Now, on the last part of the epistle... St. Paul does a comparison between Moses and our Lord Jesus Christ. And to understand this better, we have to remember what we read in the Old Testament. We read that Moses, after he came down from Mount Sinai, where he received the commandments, the Ten Commandments, he, it, it says in the Bible that his face was uh, shining, his face was resplendent, because he had been talking to God so much that he, he was, in a certain way, you could say, transfigured in a proper proportion. And so he was, it was such an awe-inspiring sight that people did, couldn't see him. They couldn't look at him in his eyes. And, and they actually begged him to cover his face because it was just too resplendent and too impressive for them to, to see that. And so St. Paul tells us, if that... If that, the Old Testament, the ministration of death, he calls it, which was engraven with letters upon stones, meaning the stones that God gave to Moses, if this Old Testament was so glorious that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, and he says, this ministry, meaning the Old Testament, which is made void, meaning now it has ceased and it passed to the New Testament, How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather in glory? Meaning, how will not be the New Testament, this New Testament that God has created with Jesus Christ, where, that we are the ministers of now, how will this be not much, how will this not be much more glorious? If the administration of the Old Testament, which was incomplete, was so glorious, it was so powerful, it was so good, How good will it be, the ministration of the New Testament, which 
my dear friends, you enjoy today with the Catholic priests and the Catholic Church and our sacraments and the Mass. And here we have a transition, you could say very smooth, to the, to the Gospel. Because you enjoy those things that St. Paul tells us are so glorious and that so many people in the past could not enjoy. You enjoy this new ministry of glory. Our Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples, Blessed are the eyes that see the things that you see. Many prophets and kings have desired to see the things that you see, and they have not seen them. And to hear the things that you hear and have not heard them. Think of how privileged we are in having, as I always say, in having the Holy Church in being able to hear this glorious ministry of which St. Paul speaks, of being able to listen to the words of the Son of God that came down to earth, of being able to touch and receive the body of the Son of God that came down to earth and that is here in Denver, in Colorado, or wherever you might be in your church. Right there, the Son of God, the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, present. King David wanted to see that, he didn't get to. Solomon wanted to see that, he didn't get to. Abraham, Moses, Noah, all these people from the Old Testament wished with all their heart they could see these moments that you get to see. And they did not get to see it. Now to go into today's Gospel, it says that a certain lawyer stood up tenting our Lord and saying to him, What must I do to possess eternal life? Remember that our Lord was in a certain way challenging the established teachers of his time. The Pharisees, especially, were a very close group, and they demanded that all the people listened to them and heard them, and the people took the Pharisees as the interpretation of the law. No one would question them. But then comes our Lord, who was not part of any group, who was just someone that came out and not from any school, not from any uh, school of any rabbi, and he started teaching, and that challenged them. But then again, when the, when the master of the law asks our Lord, our Lord answers to him with certain irony. He knows, our Lord knows what's in his heart. Our Lord knows that he's just trying to put him to the test. And so he answers to him as a teacher would answer to a boy that makes a stupid question. He says, what is written in the law? What do you read? You know the answer, you can tell me. And so the teacher said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. My dear friends, this first commandment would give matter for a whole sermon. But I want to tell you something that you might find interesting. This was the Our Father of the Jewish people. They call it the Shema Israel. It was the, the verse of the Bible that begins, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. And from that, for after that verse, you would have these words that you read here. So these words were repeated by the Jews. Some of it was supposed to be repeated at least twice a day. Shema Israel, hear Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. He actually, that last part, the Pharisee got it from another part of the Bible. So he knew the answer. And our Lord says to him, then, thou hast answered rightly, this do, and thou shalt live. But the Pharisee hadn't, didn't have enough. He wanted to make it a scholarly issue. He wanted to have some kind of an intellectual discussion. And so he says to him, who is my neighbor? Now, now in our days, we don't have any question of who our neighbor is. We know, because we have read this and heard this so much, we know that our neighbor is basically anyone that is near to us, anyone that, he, that we can do help to. But back in that day, for the Jews, that was not the case. The Jews believed, in, in, based on religious beliefs, they believed that not everyone was supposed to be done good, that not everyone was supposed to be helped, 
that you were supposed to hate your enemy and do evil to your enemy and do good to your friend. And the rabbis actually made this distinction even more accurate, so to speak, and they would distinguish friends and foes even from the chosen people in such a way that you were not supposed to love everyone in the chosen people, but even there you were supposed to make distinctions. So it was a, it was a debated question. And our Lord answers by giving this beautiful parable that you read. The point that we ought to take from the parable is that many times those who were supposed to do more charity, those who, were, who had as a duty to do the right thing, will pass by and will not do the, the, deed, the deed of charity, the deed of love of our neighbor that we ought to. To understand the idea that our Lord is conveying here. A Samaritan back in the day was supposed to be a heretic. He wasn't part of the chosen people. So our Lord says a priest goes by first and he doesn't help this person. And then a Levite, which is a helper of a priest, goes by and he doesn't help the person. And then this heretic, this person that you would reject, this person that you would think is a bad person, comes and he is the one that was good to him, to the victim. And so what do you learn from this? You learn from this that all those distinctions that you make, all that pride that you have, all that idea that you have that you're not to help this person or that this person doesn't deserve your help has to be taken away and you are to help everyone who you can help. Our Lord says at the end, go and do thou in like manner. Now, this parable has a lot to it that we could talk about, but I want to finish today's sermon by making two points about the love of our neighbor. The first one is this. Consider whenever you lack in charity towards the people next to you, and this is most important towards the people next to you, the ones that we ought to be more charitable towards are not people that are far away, are not people that I, do I donate money to and I never see their faces. Is not people that I see in the streets once. The people that I ought to have more charity towards are those that are near to me, my neighbor, proximo. And that would be my wife, my husband, my father, my mother, my grandma, my grandpa, my children, my friends. Whenever you mistreat anyone, close to you. Remember what our Lord said in another part of the gospel. With that measure that you measure, you will be measured. In other words, he said, if you treat badly your neighbor, in that same way God will treat you. How do you treat your wife? That's how God will treat you. How do you treat your husband? That's how God will treat you. How do I treat my parents, abandoning them perhaps, or not helping them as I should? That's how God will treat me. How do I treat my children? I think you get the point. The other point that I would like to mention very briefly. True love of our neighbor is not to please them. Loving someone and pleasing them is not the same. It is not equal. When I truly love someone, I must love them in such a way that I seek good for them. I seek true good for them. And so St. Augustine tells us, this is a quote from St. Augustine that is very, very good. He says, you'll tell me, I love my neighbor as myself. Well, I hear what you say, St. Augustine tells his listener. I do. You wish to get drunk and party with your neighbor because you love him as yourself. And you say, well, let's pass it well today, you know, let's party today, let's drink as much as we can. And you say, that's loving my neighbor, because that's what I want to do myself, so I want my neighbor to do the same. I want to party with him. But if this is so, St. Augustine says, if you think that loving yourself and loving your neighbor is pleasing yourself and pleasing your neighbor, giving to yourself as much as you want and giving, giving to your neighbor as much as you want, then you don't love yourself. You love iniquity. You love sin. And if this is so, Jesus Christ says, then you hate yourself. 
If such is your love, St. Augustine says, if you love yourself in such a way that you bring doom and damnation to your soul, certainly those whom you love as you love yourself, you will also bring damnation to them. And therefore, St. Augustine continues, I don't want you to love anyone. Be lost alone. Either change the kind of love you have for yourself, or step away from the rest of the men and don't share that twisted love that you have. I'll end today's sermon with a quote from Pius XII, which emphasizes again this point. He says, What did Christ love in men, if not God? Not that Christ found God in all men as they were, but Christ wanted, through his love, to restore God in the heart of all men. It is said that a doctor loves the sick. But what is it that he loves in the sick? It is for sure not the sickness. No, he loves the health that he seeks to restore in the patient. Therefore, charity, true love, means that you must love one another in this way, with the intention of introducing God more and more in the lives of others. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.